Dear friends, welcome to the webinars on sick newborn care. In this session, we shall discuss briefly about neonatal seizures. Seizures, as we know, are the most common manifestations of neurological dysfunction in the newborn period. They usually occur because of an underlying severe illness that warrants urgent treatment. Moreover, seizures themselves may cause brain injury. It is therefore important to identify them early and manage them in an appropriate manner. The objectives of this webinar are to understand and learn the types and common etiologies of seizures, approach to and the management of neonatal seizures, prognostic factors and the outcome of neonatal seizures. Seizures are defined as the paroxysmal alterations in neurological function, be it motor, behavior or autonomic functions. This broad definition includes both epileptic seizures in which there is an associated seizure activity in the electroencephalogram or EEG and the non-epileptic seizures in which there is no activity in the EEG. The incidence of neonatal seizures is 1 to 3.5 per thousand live births. Obviously, the incident varies with the level of sickness gestation and birth weight. For example, the incidence in very low birth weight neonates is almost 20-fold higher than that of term neonates. Broadly, seizures are classified into four major types, subtle seizures, clonic, tonic and myoclonic seizures. In general, myoclonic seizures carry the worst prognosis while the focal clonic seizures have the best prognosis. Among the four types, subtle seizure is the most common type. The major manifestations of subtle seizures include ocular movements such as tonic deviation of eyes or sustained eye opening, orofacial lingual movements like chewing and lip smacking, limb movements like cycling and pedaling, autonomic phenomena such as fluctuations in the heart rate, and apnea. Some of these moments are not consistently associated with seizure activity in the AAG. Differentiating seizures from other abnormal movements like jitteredness is often a difficult task. The following points usually help in distinguishing these two abnormal moments. Unlike seizures, jitteredness is not associated with any abnormal ocular moments like eye fixation or tonic eye deviation. Moreover, the movements in jitteredness are typically stimulus sensitive and often stop with passive restraint. Also, the predominant movement in jitteredness is tremor, which is more rapid than the typical clonic jerks. Finally, there will be no associated autonomic disturbances in jitteredness. A number of conditions can cause seizures in the neonatal period. Of these, the most common ones are hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, metabolic disturbances like hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia, meningitis and intracranial hemorrhage. The other uncommon causes include inborn errors of metabolism, developmental defects involving the central nervous system, benign familial and benign idiopathic neonatal convulsions, and maternal narcotic withdrawal. If you look at the prevalence of different etiologies, we observe that HIE or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is the most common etiology, accounting for almost 40% of all seizure episodes. CNS infections like meningitis contribute about 9%, while metabolic disturbances like hypoglycemia and hypocalcemia contribute to around 7.5% and 5% respectively. However, this proportion might vary depending upon the patient population in a given unit. The next part of our discussion deals with the approach to a neonate presenting with seizures. As we discussed before, the approach involves eliciting a reliable history, conducting a proper examination and ordering the relevant investigations. Remember, Acute management is the most crucial aspect in a unit with seizures. Eliciting history and doing examination should be brief 
and completed in no time. In history, we should ask for a complete description of the seizure episode, particularly the type of movements and any associated eye movements. This would help in differentiating seizures from seizure mimics like jitterness. The exact age at the onset of seizures allows us to narrow down to the possible etiology. For example, a seizure manifesting in the first three days of life is likely to be caused by hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or hypoglycemia. On the other hand, the underlying cause for a seizure manifesting after three days is likely to be meningitis. The next important history is the antenatal history. We should inquire about any fever or rash in the first trimester of pregnancy, maternal diabetes or maternal drug abuse. Given that perinatal asphyxia is the most common underlying etiology of seizures, an accurate perinatal history is a must for determining the etiology. Specifically, one should ask for any signs of fetal distress, the need for instrumentation in the form of forceps or vacuum for delivery, the steps of resuscitation required, and the UBGOS course. The cord pH and base deficit, if available, would help confirm the diagnosis of perinatal asphyxia. Lastly, the details of feeding, including the type of milk and family history, should also be obtained. While we elicit the history, the vital signs, the temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, capillary refill time, and oxygen saturation should be recorded simultaneously. We should also assess the gestation and determine the growth category. In addition, we should look for any obvious malformations or dysmorphic features. In the central nervous system examination, the higher functions and the tone should be assessed. The anterior frontal and fundus should also be examined. Finally, we should order for the relevant investigations such as blood sugar and CSF or the cerebrospinal fluid examination. If available, serum calcium should also be checked. Remember, there is no need to perform every investigation in every new unit. Having learned the approach, let us see some typical presentations of the common etiologies of neonatal seizures. In your neonate who required resuscitation at birth manifests seizures within 12 to 24 hours of life and is stuporous and floppy on examination. The cause of seizures is likely to be hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. On the other hand, a neonate with fever, stupor, bulging anterior fontanelle, and CSF pleocytosis is likely to have meningitis. An unusual neonate with poor feeding, jitteriness, and low blood sugar has hypoglycemia, while a preterm, very low birth weight neonate with sudden deterioration on day two or day three of life is likely to have severe intraventricular hemorrhage. The last part of the webinar is regarding the management of the neonate with seizures. The principles of management include supportive care and specific therapy in the form of anti-epileptic drugs. The first step in the management of seizures is to provide supportive care, which includes maintaining normal temperature, securing the airway, providing respiratory support including oxygen or ventilation as required, and maintaining adequate perfusion. Once these ABCs are taken care of, we should check the blood glucose value. If the blood glucose is less than 45 mg per deciliter, we should administer 2 ml per kg of intravenous bolus of 10% dextrose, immediately follow it up with dextrose infusion at 6 mg per kg per minute. The blood sugar should be checked after 30 minutes of starting the infusion. If the initial blood glucose is more than 45 mg or, or the seizures continue even after hyperglycemia is corrected, we have to provide specific therapy in the form of anti-epileptic drugs. The first line anti-epileptic drug in neonates is phenobarbital. It has to be administered as a bolus of 20 mg per kg slowly over 20 minutes by intravenous road. If the seizures continue, the phenobarbital should be repeated in the dose of 10 mg per kg 
every 30 minutes until a total dose of 40 mg per kg is reached. If the seizures are still not controlled, administer a bolus dose of ferritoin that is 20 mg per kg by intravenous infusion over 15 to 20 minutes. Note that these neonates who require phenytoin or phenobobitone are at a high risk of respiratory depression and might require positive pressure ventilation. So we should make necessary arrangements for referral if the unit is not well equipped to provide optimal respiratory support. But if you are working in a level 3 unit with adequate monitoring and ventilation facilities, phenytoin should be repeated in the dose of 10 mg per kg for ongoing seizures. If the seizure is still not controlled, you can administer either levetiracetam or lidocaine to control the seizures. In some units, levetiracetam is preferred over phenytoin as a second line anti-epileptic drug after 40 mg per kg of phenobarbitone has been administered. The other anti-epileptic drugs used in units include midazolam and lorazepam. Midazolam has to be administered as a bolus of 0.15 mg per kg followed by infusion of 0.1 to 0.4 mg per kg per hour. Both midazolam and lorazepam can result in respiratory depression, so avoid using them if the ventilation facilities are not available. Once the seizures are controlled, maintenance dose of phenobarbitone should be started 12 hours after the lost seizures. IV medications should be stopped one by one with phenobarbitone being the last one. After 72 hours, you should perform neurological examination and EEG. If both of them are normal, phenobarbitone can be safely stopped. But if either neurological examination or EEG is abnormal, the neonate should be continued on maintenance phenobarbitone. He should be reassessed after one month if the neurological examination is normal, phenomorbitone can be stopped. But if it is abnormal, an EEG has to be done. And further continuation of therapy would be based on the EEG results. The prognosis in a neonate with seizures depends upon multiple factors. Of these, the most important parameters include the etiology of seizures, gestational age of the neonate, neurological examination at discharge, and EEG findings. In general, late onset hypocalcemia and subarachnoid hemorrhage have very good prognosis. Conditions like hypoglycemia and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy have intermediate prognosis in the sense that the outcome will depend upon the severity of the insult. Some conditions like developmental defects of central nervous system have uniformly bad prognosis. Overall, the prognosis was in preterm neonates than in term neonates. EEG, if available, can be really helpful in predicting the long term outcomes. In particular, the background activity of EEG is a very reliable predictor of long term outcome. Abnormal neurological examination at the time of discharge is also a very good predictor of poor long term outcomes. The key messages of the webinar are the following. The common causes of neonatal seizures are hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, hypoglycemia and meningitis. An accurate history and examination along with the relevant investigations help in determining the etiology of seizures in most neonates. Hypoglycemia should be ruled out before initiating specific therapy in neonates with seizures. Phenobarbitone reminds the first line anti-epileptic drug in your needs with seizures. Thank you.